BBC Radio 3, the time now is 8 minutes to 11. Well, we decided to stay with the Oslo Philharmonic Orchestra's numerous proms encores earlier this evening, so I apologise if we've kept you waiting for tonight's edition of Mixing It. But here it is now. And inspired by Brian Eno, Mark Russell and Robert Sandel decided not only to generate some music of their own, but also by way of a tribute to Eno's recent publication, A Year with Swollen Appendices, to commit their diaries to the microphone. So tonight's Mixing It comes to you not with an evening's worth, but instead a week's worth of music. Mixing It, the Diary Edition. Oh, Monday morning. Monday morning, sitting in the car waiting to drive to work. Seems like a good place to do the diary, the car, because it's where I listen to most of the music. You get more time to yourself, the phone doesn't ring, and you can t play it as loud as you like and nobody complains. Oh, I've had a funny old weekend. It's been very rock. I had to write some pieces about Nirvana and Pink Floyd for the paper, which is quite strange, going back to those albums after so long. And I went to see Oasis at Nebworth. What an extraordinary experience that was. The thing that that really made me think about is why do people go to live concerts in the open air like that? What do they get out of it? They don't seem to be having a joyfully festive time with each other. They can hardly see anything. Where I was standing you couldn't even see the, the video screens because people were on top of each other's shoulders. The sound is exactly the same as it is on the record. The band don't do anything except stand there and play. And there we all are. We've all paid upwards of 20 pounds to stand in this enormous field. And you think, now, with all the other ways there are of listening to music, what are people getting out of it? Anyway, it was a phenomenon, but it wasn't a particularly intriguing musical phenomenon. However, I'm going to drive to work now. I'm going to listen to Dana Bryant, Wishing from the Top. We played some of this on Mixing It, one track, before the album came out, which I really loved. And there are some fantastic things on this record. I particularly like a track called Food, where she talks about all these Nigerian foods that she can... Well, she can't get very easily, but that she dreams of in America. So, that should keep the traffic at bay for a bit, especially if I turn it up nice and loud. Yum! All beef patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed, bun. Mickey D's essential to 42nd and second lunch breaking on the fast track. I'm packing my mini backpack with two Big Macs. There's no time today. I'm late. But in my heart, if I had my way, I'd take a rhythm and grind break. Truth be told, my ultimate goal is to feed my thoughts and soul with food I never make. Mama Carolina, yasa chiki mafa, mafa legume kusi supu e fufu. Carolina. I crave food lovingly prepared by the wrinkled, supper-stained hands of my grands with creases in places I remember them to be. Their pots blackened by the oils of 4,000 seasons of history. Louisiana. Auntie Ancient's jambalaya recipe with shrimps and oysters or cooked onion rings with slivers of liver, fat back and beans, black eyed peas, collard greens. Char char gulla rice, cocktails in cracked ice, Dixie cups. Juice out of strawberry jam jars, sips and soft songs, ham hocks draped in pork bones. Sustenance, food, a 4,000 season history of Nigerian roadside mama put selling steaming white yams with red stew, yasa chicken, mafa o legume, a goosey soup with fufu. Mafa legume, goosey soup with fufu. Nigeria. 4,000 seasons of history, of making ground yield delicacies abundantly. Cracking the cassava melon gently. Picking the guava fruit spiritually.
five after eight, I'm working late. Another day, I pass the test of streets doing traffic, people scrambling faster, cars hiccuping, garbage mess. Another day, another dollar. In every way, I play for power. And indigestion is the price I pay to win. But when I take a break, brown bagging it in a public place, I dream cuisine that makes me feel whole again. La 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 It's Monday, about uh, seven o'clock, and I've had a day out. I've been uh, been recording in another studio. Uh, in London, I've been doing some music for a TV commercial. <laughs> it was quite funny. I won't say which one. Um, it was nice to get out, anyway. And um, it all seems to have gone off all right. And I uh, came back in, and I had the new Black Dog CD, music for short films and adverts. So I put that on. I thought that was rather appropriate. Really like that. <laughs> Well, actually, do I like it? Yeah. It's, um, I think it'll grow on me. It sounds like it's, um, it's rather underworked, but, um, yeah, I generally like it. So, um, yeah, I feel like I've been working hard all day, so I'm going to have the evening off. Tuesday morning, ah, what a day yesterday was. I got to meet one of my great heroes, one of the people who first inspired me when we started mixing it, John Lurie of the Lounge Lizards, who was uh, over in London after his concert at the uh, QEH. What a wonderful man. He was completely frazzled. He'd come all the way to Europe to promote an album which he's just discovered is not going to be released because of some argument between his record company and the company that distributes it in America. And he was the most extraordinarily good-humoured, good-tempered man. I expected somebody a lot cooler, a lot more reserved, a lot more difficult, really. And he was so friendly. Plus, he had a voice. God, he sounded like he was gargling concrete. It was extraordinary. The kind of voice that, for some reason, only Americans seem to be able to come up with. But he was great. It was very nice to meet him. And it was nice to see him in such good spirits, because uh, he hasn't had the best of luck over the years, I suppose, although he has been made into a bit of a style icon. That was... That was born out of necessity, apparently. But, um, no, it's inspiring. It's always a bit... can be a bit daunting meeting people you really admire. The reality can be somewhat disappointing. Not in his case, though. Now, <clears throat> what am I going to listen to today? Well, I've got this record by a guy called Lewis Taylor, who quite interests me. He's a sort of British R&B singer who seems to have spent an unusual amount of time listening to Tangerine Dream and other European kraut-rockish kind of acts. And, uh... The results are quite interesting, what I've heard so far. Hmm. Typical Robert choice. It's Tuesday night, it's about uh, half past eleven at night, and I've just 
finished doing my work. The uh, my other life as a composer for TV programs and that kind of thing. So all day today, I've been uh, I've been recording a sax player and a guitarist for some music that I've written. Um, and it's gone on all day and all night, really. So I haven't had a chance to listen to anything else. But I've really been thinking about the uh, the Lounge Lizards gig that I saw last night at the Festival Hall. They were absolutely fantastic. They didn't play any material that I knew. I assume it's all off their new album. And uh, I've just got a copy of the, uh, in fact, a cassette of the album. So I'm really looking forward to hearing that. I'll listen to that tomorrow at some point. I've really been thinking about uh, the... Uh, what Brian Eno was talking about, his new composing system. I've been thinking, could I do what I do, writing music for TV, any easier if I had that kind of system? I don't know. I'd quite like to experiment. In fact, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the software. We're going on Thursday to the company that makes that uh, the software that Brian Eno's been using, so I'm really looking forward to seeing that. Anyway, I'm going to go to bed now, absolutely knackered. Beautifully sunny day it is outside. It's Wednesday, and um, I've, I got up quite early this morning. Did all the final mixes of that uh, TV music I was doing last night. Sent that off. Then I sat down with a cup of coffee and listened to the Lounge Lizards cassette, and it is just brilliant. Best Lounge Lizards album I've heard. And it was amazing actually because I could I could remember practically everything on it from last night. It's rare that you go and see a concert, you go and hear a concert, and you can actually remember all the tracks that were played. It's such a distinctive sound, this album. I can see it's going to be uh, dislodging the Django Bates album from my uh, hi-fi system as the most popular thing on it. I've also got a stack of CDs to 
listen to for uh, the next Mixing It program, so I shall start getting through those. It's a cathartic thing, really, listening to CDs. If I want to lose myself, I'll uh, start rummaging away through the pile, seeing what takes my fancies, putting it on. And I, I find a lot that what I listen to really is dependent on what kind of mood I'm in. It's sunny outside and I'm feeling quite up, so um, looking through this stack in front of me, well, who knows what I'll be listening to. You'll be able to find out tomorrow. So, dear diary, here I am back in the car. Interesting day yesterday. I had lunch with um, Simon Jeffs, the Penguin Cafe Orchestra, who just moved down to Somerset and set up his Penguin Cafe concept in a big old house down there. Got a studio. He's sort of reforming the band now. I mean, it never was a band. It was more of a collective. But uh, he's writing lots of new material. He loves living down there, although he bumped into Brian Eno a few days ago, he was telling me. And Brian Eno, who tried living in Suffolk, assured Simon that he'd be back within three years and that the lack of urban stimulation would get to him. Simon begs to differ. And for the rest of that, I met a guy earlier in the day called Matt Wynn, who operates under the name of D-Note, and he does a very interesting sort of fusion, really, of um, dance and avant-garde minimalism. He wanted to be a jazz musician. He trained as a flautist, and he realised there wasn't much of a living to be made in that. So he moved into the dance area, and he's putting together an album of um, stuff, which is a very interesting fusion. It doesn't always work, but when it's good, it's very, very good. He plays the flute, he gets his Steve Reichlitz in, and uh, he gets some very good soul vocalists, like... Um, Carleen Anderson's sister playing as well. So I'm quite enthusiastic about Dino. I think there could be something to watch there. And um, I think I'm going to listen to some of it in the car now, as a matter of fact. It's about seven o'clock and it's Thursday. And uh, it's been a long day. Set off very early to go down to Bracknell to see this uh, Koan software, the, the software that Brian Eno has been using for his latest album. And um, what do I think about this system? Well... Fiddling around on it, it made me realise how deeply Brian Eno has actually gone into it. That his pieces, although they sound simple, they're deceptively simple, because he's really got to know the software intimately. He really knows how to work it. He really knows how to uh, get the best out of a rather crappy-sounding sound card that you have to use inside the computer. And it made me realise how long you need to work on any particular computer system. Uh, Robert and I tried to write our own pieces. <laughs> made me realise how uh, you can do all sorts of different kinds of music. You don't only have to do ambient. They specialised in some dance music that sounded very good. And uh, it was a very enlightening day, but it was, all, it was also very frustrating. I, I wanted to sort of get on this software and get it to do things, but it, uh, the, the idea of generative music, it doesn't work as easily as you think it will. You expect the results will be very easy to hear, but uh, they, were, they were not. You, Basically, you just need plenty of time working on the system. So we each wrote a piece, and the, the people at uh, Cowan are going to try and uh, fiddle around with them and make them half decent, I think. But, uh, yeah, it, um, it really changed what I thought about the software. I'd be very interested to hear what the pieces come back sounding like. <laughs> right, I'm off for another day. Thank you.
the morning after the night before, but yesterday was a very good day. Mark and I went down to Coan in the morning, drove out to Berkshire in the glorious sunshine, and buried ourselves in this very modern building with the uh, Coan people and tried to make music with it. And it was very interesting. Mark really pushed the parameters of this system, this generative system, to the absolute limit and came out with something which generated itself into unlistenability just about. Sorry, Mark. And um, <clears throat> I was much more conservative and came out with something possibly less interesting but slightly less um, hard on the ears. were fascinating. They've got an absolutely messianic sense that this technology is going to take over the world. And um, for the life of me, I can't see how an ordinary person could ever work that stuff. I mean, it takes them ages to get the, uh, get the parameters set up. But anyway, we were there for three or four hours, and it was, um, at the very least, it was good fun. Anyway, after that, Mark and uh, the producer went back to London, and I nipped into the car and went on down to box to Peter Gabriel's real world studios where he was having a kind of an open day and it was wonderful the weather of course was glorious and there we were sitting on the lawn drinking pims watching Hukwe Zawose this traditional Tanzanian musician and his dancers in full traditional costume and it was all so English it was funny the music was great um, but the occasion was just so I don't know, it was sort of like, like an England of a bygone era. There was something very strangely nostalgic about it. The idea of this uh, benevolent sort of patriarchal figure, Peter Gabriel, bringing these musicians halfway around the world and allowing them to disport themselves on the lawn of his lovely country house. It was a, it was a funny afternoon. And then in the evening, we had a real concert in a marquee nearby. And uh, the star of that for me was the Afro-Celts, who, of course, we played on the programme. And they were really wonderful. I was always a bit worried that Simon Emerson wouldn't be able to get that lot um, into some kind of shape where they could perform on stage, but he has. They're, they're great. Wonderful. And um, so there we all were. We listened to the Afro-Celts. We listened to Jung Chem Lamo, who was this wonderful Tibetan lady. In fact, I think I'm going to listen to some of her now on my way to work, but um, calm me down. Slightly dispel my hangover, I hope. Palpini.
Sunday night, quite late. Um, I'm just back from my weekend away, and this is a sort of weekend roundup. Um, nothing much to report really, because all my listening was done in the journey um, in the car. Went down to Wiltshire, so it's about a two-hour drive. Listened to the Lounge Lizards. I just love that. Uh, where well, it's on a cassette, it's absolutely fantastic. I love it. It's my favourite Lounge Lizards album. And um, listened to the Spooky CD, which I really like. Um, one of my favourite techno albums at the moment. Well, it's not techno really, but you know what I mean. Um, listen to the new Muslim Gores CD, which I found slightly disappointing, actually. And a uh, bit, bit difficult to flick on the tracks, that one, because it's uh, one huge long track that lasts about 68 minutes. Uh, listen to the Django Bates CD, which is a bit of a favourite. Um, oh, what else? Oh, various things. <laughs> listen to an old Jimi Hendrix uh, album, which was absolutely fantastic thinking more about the Koan software for what I do for writing uh, music, TV and radio I think it would only have very limited applications um, because most, most music that I do has to be very very tightly worked to the pictures so you know you have to have uh, a couple of seconds of this kind of music then going into that all spotting the pictures with uh, generative music I, I think it works over long periods of time so um, I'm not sure it would be it would be very useful as a compositional tool to, to try things out. I don't know how practical it would be. Very good on dance music, I think, because you could work in your own remixes. So, uh, unfortunately, all my computers are Macintoshes, so uh, I'll have to wait until they make it available for that. 
But uh, what am I going to listen to today? Well, um, the Lounge Lizards for one. There's some Schnitke, some Arvo Pet. Um, oh, all manner of things. And I'm looking forward to it. Right, on with the listening. Koan software piece Rise by Tim Didymus, ending tonight's edition of Mixing It. For information about any of the music that was played in the programme, please send a stamped addressed envelope to Mixing It, BBC Radio 3, Broadcasting House, London W1A, 1AA. That's Mixing It, BBC Radio 3, Broadcasting House, London W1A, 1AA. The presenters, Mark Russell and Robert Standall, will be back next week with another edition of Mixing It, including an interview with John Lurie, done just before his recent concert in London. And tonight's producer was Ekene Akalawu. Now on Radio 3, time for the first programme in our Evening Composer of the Week series, featuring the music of Beethoven. Here's